Okay, ready to cook it up. Huh? What? It honestly works for a good analogy. If you want to create a health and safety document or a safe work document, really and truthfully, a lot of the steps are no different than cooking a meal. Really, they're not. And I know you're likely thinking to yourself as a health and safety professional or someone that's tasked with safety that... I don't want to write your stuff for you. Yeah, you don't really want to write some of those documents. But once again, it becomes that thing that's thrust upon you or that you just graciously accept and grab and want to turn something out. And like anything else, a lot of us are uh, humble about what we do and we just say, ah. Oh, this, I just threw it together. Really and truthfully, there's a lot of discipline that goes into creating a safe work document. So let's look at the first part. Let's look at what you put into it. Because realistically, a good safety document is only going to be as good as the stuff that you put into it. But before we get started, I just, I want to do one thing. I want to thank each and every one of you that's taken the time to click that subscribe button, to ding the bell, to like the videos, to give me all of that feedback. I appreciate all the feedback I get. Honestly, I appreciate every single comment, every single uh, response to a video. And it doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive, because a lot of times the negative comments help me to get better. So I appreciate it. I honestly do. Um, it's a good thing. So keep them coming. Thank you. On to the whole entire process. Realistically, when you get right down to it, uh, safe work documents, like I said, are like putting together a meal. And so the very first one and the very first thing I want to think about are the ingredients that go into it. So where do you get these ingredients? Where do you look for the stuff that you want to put into this whole thing? Before, like anything else, if you're going to prepare a meal, it's what kind of meal are you going to prepare? What is it for? Are you just going to bake a cake for dessert or are you going to create a whole buffet? What's the purpose behind the document that you're writing? Is it because legislation has changed? And if it's because of a legislative change, then you know what? You're going to be looking for one main ingredient. Or is it because of a new work process? You may have to combine legislation and some other best practices. Or have you got new machinery and tools? You may have another thing that you're going to lump in as part of the whole process. Is there a new work location? Have you moved to a new work location? And is there a possibility that the previous three points are also something that needs to be addressed in this document? Finally, the last thing, were you required to write one by an authority having jurisdiction? Not necessarily a good thing, but sometimes it occurs. When you're putting together your safe work document, you have to understand why you're writing it before you start selecting the ingredients. Now, as I said, the very first ingredient that you're going to be looking for at all times, and it's going to be quite common across all of your safe work documents, is the OHS legislation. When it comes to the OHS legislation, there's really only two types of legislation. You're going to have something that's performance-based or prescriptive in nature. Performance-based, and I'm Canadian, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a Canadian analogy. Hockey! Hockey! Hockey. I want you to picture the performance-based legislation is having a net, having a hockey net, two goalposts and a net. How you put that puck between the net is totally up to you. And that's what performance-based legislation is. Basically, it says, get the puck in the net. We don't care as long as you comply with the legislation, get the puck in the net. So that's basically the analogy for performance-based legislation. Now, some of the legislation is prescriptive in nature. And what I mean by that is it has step by step by step by step that you have to follow in, other, in order to be compliant with the legislation. Now, it's important to understand why some leg legislation is prescriptive-based. Often it's for high-risk or high-hazard or a combination of the two, high-risk, high-hazard work. And it's often governed by prescriptive legislation. Think about things like working at heights, working in confined spaces, uh, working with hazardous chemicals. A lot of times those pieces of legislation are going to be very prescriptive because the consequences are so dire if you don't follow those steps. So it's important to understand and to look at what is the spirit of your document and then what pieces of the legislation do you have to follow? Some of it is going to be copied and pasted almost directly from the legislation into your document. Now, the next piece is 
original equipment manufacturer's guidance. Now, you have to realize that if you're getting new equipment, new machinery, or upgrading equipment machinery, that these might be, these operating manuals and guides might be the best source for a lot of your information. Part of the reason is um, they're written by a lot of times the people that designed it. And sometimes you can get in-service training from the representatives when you've bought new equipment and you can incorporate that training and that material that they bring into your safe work document. The other thing is service manuals, especially in cases where there's preventive maintenance in order to keep a lot of the safeguards working. Think things like interlocks and power up and power down pieces of the machinery. A lot of times these have to be maintained and it's important that they're maintained correctly because the machinery and the equipment might not work safely if it's not maintained properly. And as I said before, a lot of times they may be written by the same engineers that design the machinery or tools or the uh, same engineers are providing that direction for writing these uh, original equipment manufacturer manuals. Now, the other thing is industry sector guides. Industry sector guides are usually uh, things that are like-minded industries or like industries get together and they provide, uh, they create agency associations and industry associations. And a lot of times they will produce publication that's directed towards their industry sector. So they're created by like-minded folks in similar settings. And really and truthfully, they're a good source of safe work material. They really are. Um, once again, like I said, these organizations are usually governed organizations and they have some very stiff and stringent quality assurance and quality control. So a lot of times you can actually trust these documents as a good source. Now, not all the time. I've seen some very poor industry sector um, publications, but I've seen a majority of good ones. They're very similar to peer-reviewed publications, which I'll get onto in a little bit, but they're very similar because they usually go through group review before they're ever published. And the good thing is, is because they're an industry sector or an industry-based organization, often these guides are published at very low rates or low costs, sometimes very low subscription fees, and even for that matter, sometimes free. Because a lot of times it's recognized that it's in the best interest that safety is promoted within that industry sector. The other thing is publish best practices. And they sort of coincide with the point I just talked about. Because a lot of times uh, these industry groups will publish what they call as best practices to follow. A lot of times they're well known within the industry sectors, but sometimes not as much. So hence the need for the publication. They're usually that these Things come out as uh, something that's a result of lots of industry-sponsored study. So they become a very good source for you to use as the safety professional. Or if you're a lay person that's been tasked with health and safety, I see it lots of times in organizations. They will take and say, hey, you can be the safety person. You can be the safety guy or gal. And you're looking and going, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But you're there. So what you need to do is understand that there's documents and publications that are there that you can use, and they're very helpful. So once again, they're sponsored usually by insurance or governing bodies, and they do become a very good source for what you're putting together. Now, the other piece, not used as often as people would think, but is academic journals. Now, these are peer-reviewed, tested, and tried information. It's often the first source of safety info that's gained from the scientific study. I can't think of an example right off the bat. In fact, if you think of an example, do me a favor. Leave me something in the comments. Let me know down below. I'd appreciate it. But uh, I do remember several years ago when I was in British Columbia and they started doing uh, surveys of fish stocks in um, non-tidal waters, in other words, creeks, rivers, and so forth. And what they were doing is actually shocking by putting a wand in there. And there was a battery backpack and some whatnot on their back. And they used a wand and they wore hip waders and walked around. And of course, electricity and water never go well together. But understanding that we need to figure out safe work processes for this. So we look at the original equipment manufacturers. There's no existing legislation. Everybody's scrambling. So a lot of times these extra documents do help.
Once again, sometimes these studies are sponsored by industry bodies exactly for that purpose. Now, the other thing I want to stop and mention is the secret sauce. Just like other, how should I say, I don't like to compare because I don't eat it at all, ever, fast food. But you know what? We, uh, lots of companies will have proprietary information. But health and safety, in my opinion, should never be proprietary information. So you, as a person looking to make these documents, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out at all. In fact, reaching out is super important. It's how you network and build uh, a network of people that are like-minded and want to prevent injury. So reach out to your peers. Reach out on all of the different professional sites that you can think of. If you need information, somebody is bound to help. But if they're sharing secret ingredients, remember one thing. Reciprocate. You share. Don't be afraid of sharing. It's a good thing. You want to reciprocate. You want to do unto others. You want to share the information that you've got. Or if you have information and somebody comes asking, don't be afraid to share. Now, the only one case that I've found that... Uh, organizations I've worked for have, have had a stipulation is they've wanted to make sure that there is some recognition to the work that they sponsored and paid for. So that's the only thing. A lot of times there's recognition. So if you're borrowing from somebody, recognize the work that they've done. But hey, that's really it. When you get right down to it, you got to think about the legislation that governs you. You got to think about the equipment you're using and did the manufacturer provide any information. You have to think about the industry sectors that you work in and have they provided information that you haven't grabbed or used or, or mined or gone to the well for. You got to think about the insurance organizations. A lot of times that they've published things or other published best practices that you can use. And don't forget, be part of a community. Share and share alike. Now, the next piece of this is going to be how to prepare everything and how to put it together. Do me a favor. If you like the videos, share because sharing is caring. And let me know if you like the videos. I prefer to know if you like something. So poke that like button. I appreciate it. So now I'm going to leave some videos up in either corner. Uh, in this corner will be the next video of the segment. But until then, YouTube's going to stick whatever they want there. Spoiler alert. And in this corner, what I'm going to do is leave the whole entire playlist for health and safety programs so that you can have a look at it. Hey, there we go. So I want you to do me a favor. Don't just think about safety. Don't just talk about safety, but be a safety influencer wherever you are, whether it be at work, home, play, provoke safety. Be that safety influencer. Okay, take care. Bye for now.